Thank you. The next item of business is First Minister's questions. And at question number one, I call Douglas Ross. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, the Daily Mail has today reported that SNP Minister uh, Jenny Galruth, just sat behind the First Minister, uh, may have broken the ministerial code. The former Transport Minister, who Hamza Yusuf promoted to be Cabinet Secretary for Education, changed plans that had been agreed for 18 months with just weeks to go. The original plans would have seen a small closure to rail services around her constituency for a few days just after Christmas last year to allow for essential upgrades to happen. Jenny Gilruth appears to have forced a change in order to give preferential treatment to her constituents at a higher cost to taxpayers and far more disruption to passengers. Does the First Minister think it's acceptable for a Minister to make a political decision for her own benefit instead of acting in the interests of all of Scotland? First Minister. Can I say to uh, Douglas Ross, <coughs> he is making uh, very serious uh, accusations uh, indeed. And of course, if there are uh, any accusations of the ministerial code uh, being broken, of course, they will be uh, appropriately uh, investigated. So that is an accusation that Douglas Ross uh, is making, of course, will appropriately uh, investigate it. But I don't believe uh, the way that uh, Douglas Ross has characterised uh, that particular situation to be correct at all. On uh, Sunday, uh, the 21st of May, ScotRail's new timetable uh, came, came into uh, effect. Uh, it will come into effect uh, for this year. This is another important step towards uh, Scotland's railways uh, as it continues to recover. So these timetable changes... Well, these timetable changes, uh, of course, happen uh, regularly. In terms of when they happened, when Jenny Goruth uh, was the Transport Secretary, it was done uh, for the correct reasons, certainly from uh, the investigation uh, that I have done uh, this morning, from when this story, uh, as uh, Douglas Ross says, uh, has come into the public consciousness. Uh, what I would say uh, to Douglas Ross, of course, we have invested heavily and significantly into the railway services. We have proudly taken uh, ScotRail back into public ownership and every decision we make, every decision that any transport minister under this government has made has been to the benefit uh, of the entire, rep network, uh, entire uh, railway network, including, of course, passengers up and down the country. So I don't believe the way uh, that Douglas Ross has characterised the situation uh, is how it has taken place. But, of course, uh, I will investigate the issue uh, further. Douglas Ross. Well, Let's just clear up some of the things the First Minister said there. He says he's going to investigate, but then he said he investigated this morning and sees no fault in what Jenny Gilruth did. He also questions my characterisation of what happened. So let's just go through some of the pages and pages of FOI uh, emails that we have uh, seen. A Freedom of Information response makes it clear that instead of a few days of closures after Christmas, Jenny Gilruth pushed for changes that would lead to six weeks of disruption, including four full weekends. Now, Jenny Gorruth is very keen to intervene here, but I'm just reading out what we have received. What, Mr what... Ross, if you just give me a moment. I am absolutely sure I don't need to remind members of the rules regarding behaviour in this chamber. Just be grateful if we could adhere to those, Mr Ross. Jenny Gorruth seems to have a lot to say about this, so it would be interesting to hear what she's told the First Minister. Because ScotRail advised in these emails that the plans Jenny Gorruth put forward would mean that 9,000 more customers every day would have been disrupted with her proposals. ScotRail reviewed the decision and concluded there would be, and I quote from ScotRail, greater costs with more customers disrupted or inconvenienced with the revised access plan. Jenny Garou's decision to scrap these changes appears to have cost the taxpayer at least a million pounds. Scottish Rail Holdings board papers, also released under FOI, state this. The board is asked to note that Network Rail and ScotRail chose to do the work at this time precisely to minimise the number of passengers impacted and Transport Scotland were fully aware and endorsed this approach. So how can Hamza Youssef defend Jenny Garruth when she went against the advice of Network Rail, ScotRail and Transport Scotland? First Minister. Well, first and foremost, whenever decisions like this are made, and I remember well uh, in my time as Transport Minister, it's so crucial that we engage with communities. It's so crucial that we engage with communities to understand from them what the impact of any potential 
closure will be, uh, presiding officer. And I can hear groans from either side of the benches when it comes to engaging with communities. We always engage with our communities when it comes to any potential disruption uh, to our transport network. And the proposed decarbonisation works on the vital rail line would have caused significant disruption right across the whole east coast of Scotland, including for passengers uh, travelling across, yes, Fife, but also in Dundee, Perth and Aberdeen too. And the former uh, Transport Minister Members. has stated that she was not content that everything was being done to minimise that inconvenience over a busy festive period, a time when, of course, rightly, people are travelling up and down the country to see uh, their loved ones, uh, particularly in the context also of some disruption that was taking place due to industrial action at the time. And therefore, she rightly, uh, in my view, asked Network Rail to postpone the works, which they agreed to, to give time to engage with the communities which would be impacted by uh, the closure. So, uh, to conclude, uh, Presiding Officer, for me, it's so vital that whoever the Transport Minister is, whether it was Jenny Goruth previously, the current Transport Minister, that the needs of passengers should always be front and centre when such decisions are made. And that was clearly the case uh, when Jenny Goruth uh, made that decision. Douglas Ross. This is getting worse for the First Minister. He's now saying that Jenny Goruth was right to do this. And he also said that, that Jenny Goruth, as the former Transport Minister, thought there were problems with this. Well, we'll come to another email. On the 19th of October 2022, Miss Goruth understands why they are doing this, but it's not going to land well. So she agreed with the proposal, but she was worried about how it was going to land with her constituents. She should not even have been involved in this decision. She should have recused herself because of the clear potential for a conflict of interest. Concerns were raised about the Minister's actions. One civil servant, whose name is redacted in the FOI response, said this. It might be wise to be clear why this is appropriate for Fife in particular, because other areas might expect similar. This political interference may even have forced a senior executive to resign. Chris Gibb worked in the rail industry for more than 40 years. He chaired ScotRail in 2022. He resigned just a few weeks after Jenny Goldroo's decision, after he advised against the change. And in board papers that we've seen, he raised concerns about political interference and a quote from Chris Gibb, micromanagement by Scottish ministers, advisers and officials. First Minister, did Chris Gibb resign because of Jenny Goroos' inappropriate actions? First Minister. Uh, Ross, uh, once again, presiding officer, is making really serious uh, accusations, uh, I'm afraid, uh, without any evidence. And what he is hoping to do, uh, and, and, and he'll do this because he is undoubtedly desperate, is throw as much mud as possible and hoping that some of it sticks. Members! He will throw as much mud as possible and hope that some of it sticks. And what I would say to Douglas Ross is that conflicts of interest and the Conservative Party are not something, are, not, <laughs> are definitely not uh, a combination that I think... Uh, he should Thank look, you. Uh, to raise. And what I would say to Douglas uh, Ross in response to the emails that he'd read out, of course, he is uh, being selective in yeah. what he is reading out. Yeah. What he's forgetting to mention is that this disruption, would, which would undoubtedly have been caused because of these works, wouldn't just have affected passengers travelling across Fife, but also Dundee, Perth. Aberdeen and other parts of the network too. So absolutely right. I would expect uh, my transport minister, I would expect any member uh, of uh, the government to make sure that they are taking account of all of those who might be impacted and all of those who might be uh, affected. So what I would say to Douglas Ross is look at the facts. Don't just throw around mud hoping some of it sticks. And speculation, frankly, doesn't help anybody in here. Certainly doesn't help passengers uh, that we are committed to in improving the rail network for. Douglas Ross. Do you know what didn't help passengers? It was the former Transport Minister's decision. She was emailed on the 7th of November 2022 at 17.40 and told by ScotRail that greater costs and more customers would be disrupted and inconvenienced with the revised plans. At least a million extra in associated costs and 9,000 additional passengers every day because of the decision she took. So the First Minister can cut out all that rubbish about standing up for passengers when it's very clear that the decision taken by Jenny Goruth 
led to a poorer service. Now, this looks like a clear breach of the ministerial code. Jenny Garruth is smirking at this, and well she might, because the First Minister already seems to believe she is innocent. But the ministerial code states that you must keep separate the roles of a minister and their role as a constituency MSP. This doesn't just look like there was preferential treatment in the constituency. It looks like a truly awful decision that will cost taxpayers millions and lead to greater disruption. Five months on, five months on, the essential works that Jenny Goruth delayed have still not happened. This looks like a clear-cut, sackable offence. But at the very least, at the very least, this needs more than the First Minister looking at this over breakfast. It needs an urgent investigation now. So will the First Minister confirm to Parliament right now that he will launch an investigation into his Minister today? First Minister. To my understanding, this uh, is not the first time this issue uh, has uh, been raised. I think it has been raised uh, months uh, before as well. Now, of course, I wasn't First Minister at the time. I will, as I said in my response, in response to Douglas Ross's, Douglas Ross's first question, I will look at uh, the accusations uh, that are uh, being made. But what I would say to Douglas Ross, of course, is that Jenny Goruth uh, was not and is not also the MSP for Dundee, Perth and Aberdeen. These decisions were taken, of course, because they were affecting railway passengers right across Members. the network and particularly across uh, the north east uh, of Scotland. So with the information that I absolutely have in front of me, it seems to me pretty clear that Jenny Goruth made those decisions so that, of course, disruption wouldn't affect more passengers right across uh, the network. Uh, that is something I would expect Jenny Goruth to have done at the time. It's like something I expect the current Transport Minister to do. When these uh, important, vital works, particularly around decarbonisation, have to take place, how do we do them in a way that they minimise disruption, particularly during the busy, festive period? And what I would say uh, to the Conservatives is that we take the issues of the Ministerial Code extremely seriously. Not something that could be said about the Conservatives by any way, shape or form. Question number two, Anna Sarwar. Presenting officer, next month it will be three years since the Scottish Hospitals inquiry was announced. And these are the facts we already know. Firstly, two children died because of infections they contracted at the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital. Secondly, there were serious failings at Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board, which resulted in the health board being put into special measures. <coughs> Thirdly, Louise Lawrence whose husband, Andrew, died after contracting aspergillus, was kept in the dark by a cover-up. Despite all of this, the Chair and the Chief Executive of the Health Board still have their jobs, and no one has been held responsible. Now, this week, the Health Board, under the same leadership, has shamefully refused to accept many of the conclusions of the Oversight Board, and they have even called into question the entire basis of the independent review that expose fatal infections in clinically vulnerable children. So, First Minister, why should people who refuse to accept even the most basic facts be trusted to run Scotland's largest health board? First Minister. I say that uh, Anas Awar has raised these issues uh, rightly uh, on many occasions. And, of course, uh, there is, as he has already said in his question, there is already a public inquiry taking place in relation to a number of the issues uh, that he has raised. I think it's important that we don't prejudice uh, an inquiry uh, that is taking place and, of course, wait for the outcome uh, fully in terms of that inquiry and then, of course, appropriate action uh, will be taken in respect to those issues. But, of course, it is important uh, and we have made uh, it clear that, it's, that, that we are not waiting for that inquiry to finish where we can take remedial action, where we can take action uh, to improve the situation and across a number of areas uh, that Anas, uh, Anas uh, Sauer's right to raise uh, in this chamber uh, that is being taken. And of course my understanding certainly is that a number of the oversight board uh, recommendations uh, have uh, indeed uh, not just been accepted uh, but, uh, but work is well well underway uh, in relation to some uh, of those recommendations. Uh, so it is important that uh, you know, these issues of course are raised uh, here by uh, members right across uh, the chamber. Uh, my thoughts are uh, with all of those uh, families uh, that have been impacted and have been affected uh, by some of the challenges that the Health Board uh, undoubtedly has faced. Uh, but I will continue, and I know the Health Secretary will continue, to engage with Glasgow, uh, Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board uh, to make sure uh, that these recommendations of the Oversight Board uh, are indeed taken forward. Anna Sarwar. I think the First Minister misses the point. It's that we are going backwards now because the Health Board leadership 
are saying they do not accept many of the findings of the Oversight Board, and they now do not accept the findings of the independent case note review that highlighted these infections. And I think that's the point that the First Minister is missing, because as Health Secretary, Jean Freeman understood that grieving families needed justice. She listened to the voices of families and campaigners and put the Health Board into special measures, and she established the inquiry. But when Hamza Youssef took over, he was too weak and easily led, and he lifted the board out of special measures and empowered those people that failed. Now, less than a year later, the leadership of the board are trying to rubbish the independent review and questioning the accepted facts. Kimberly Darrick, whose daughter Millie Main died, says that the board is making the families' lives hell. And Louise Florence says this. Enough is enough. Patients have been harmed. Others lost their lives. Families lied to and bullied. For what? To protect the reputation of Scotland's flagship hospital and that of the Scottish Government. So, First Minister, will you allow, will you allow the leadership of this health board to rewrite the facts and continue to prolong the agony for these families? First Minister. I, I, I won't. Of course, we'll hold, we will hold uh, the health board uh, leadership absolutely to account in relation to the oversight recommendations uh, that have been made. And of course, uh, the reason why uh, the Greater Glasgow and Clyde were de-escalated in relation to special measures uh, was because the majority of those oversight recommendations uh, were accepted, work was underway, many of them uh, also uh, complete. And that's why decisions around de-escalation uh, were made. Uh, in relation to uh, patients uh, and those that have suffered, and, and uh, of course, uh, Anna Sawa again has raised the cases uh, of, uh, of, of Millie uh, Main, of course, of Andrew uh, Slawrence. In that regard, I'm always happy, and the Cabinet Secretary for Health uh, will, and Social Care will also be happy uh, to meet with those families uh, involved. But we have brought forward a number of measures to improve transparency and making sure that families do get the answers when, unfortunately, in those rare cases, things uh, do go wrong, such as the duty uh, of candour, for example. We introduced that organisational duty of candour uh, in April uh, 2018, places that legal duty on all health and social care organisations to be open, to be honest when something uh, goes wrong. Uh, the Patient Safety Commissioner that we have committed to uh, as well in terms of the legislation uh, being introduced in response to that important Baroness uh, Cumberledge uh, report. Uh, and in terms of whistleblowing, uh, we have made it clear, and I certainly made it clear uh, when I was the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Social Care, that whistleblowing is an integral and important tool that should be used by staff in order to raise concerns uh, where they feel it's necessary and where it's appropriate. And I met in my time as Cabinet Secretary for Health and Social Care uh, every single whistleblowing uh, champion right across health boards up and down the country, including uh, the whistleblowing champion at Greater Glasgow uh, and Clyde. So we'll do everything uh, we can in our power. We'll hold, of course, uh, the health board absolutely to account. In my conversations uh, with the leadership of Greater Glasgow and Clyde, they certainly understood the seriousness of the issues here. What we'll make sure we do on behalf of the people of Scotland in government is make sure that when things do go wrong, in the rare times that they do, uh, the vast majority of people will get a good service from our health service. And the, in, the, in the rare times when things do go wrong, we'll make sure that families get the answers that they deserve. Anna Sarwar. The First Minister has not held these people responsible to account. He's empowered those people that have failed these families. And frankly, and frankly, staff at the hospital, patients that have been failed and families will listen to that answer from the First Minister with rage and think he's completely out of touch with the reality they face every single day. Because six years into this scandal, and the established facts are being denied by a health board leadership who are prepared to do anything to protect their own jobs. But this is what we've come to expect from this SNP government. No one ever takes responsibility, and failure is rewarded with promotion. The chair of the health board, still in his job. The chief executive, awarded an Excellence in Leadership Award. The health secretary, when the hospital was opened, and when Millie Main died, now the deputy first minister. And the, health secretary, and the Health Secretary, who took the failing board out of special measures, now the First Minister. Under the SNP, failure is rewarded, incompetence is excused, and the Scottish people are left suffering the consequences. So, First Minister, if you are too weak to stand up for these grieving families fighting for justice, how can the people of Scotland trust you to stand up for them when it really matters? First Minister. Well, I, I think this is... 
This is the point, is that uh, Anas Awar can spin in any way he wishes to do so. But the people of Scotland, of course, have continued to trust the SNP with the health service time and time and time again. And why have they done that? They've done that because we've invested record amounts into our health service. They've done that, uh, of course, because we steered this country through the biggest shock the NHS has ever faced in its 74-year existence. They've done that, of course, because our NHS staff are the best paid here than anywhere else in the UK. So we do value our staff. I seem to remember quite well doing a debate here when Anna Sarwar uh, was uh, leading a debate for the Labour Party on health, where, of course, staff at Greater Glasgow and Clyde, doctors and nurses, criticised uh, the politicisation that Anna Sarwar uh, was, uh, was doing uh, at the time uh, in relation, uh, in relation uh, to, of course, uh, the health service here uh, in Scotland. So what I would say uh, to Anna Sarwar is the, the decision to, to, to de-escalate Greater Glasgow and Clyde was made because of the evidence that we had uh, in front of us. I'm happy for him to see that evidence uh, once again and to provide him uh, with detail uh, once again. What we'll continue to do is make sure that, as I say, in the rare times that things do go wrong, we'll continue to make sure that we do everything in our power to make sure there's absolute transparency that families get the answers that they want, and I am more than happy as First Minister to meet with the families uh, that Anna Sarwar mentions that have undoubtedly been affected by where that failure has happened. Question number three, Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister for what reason only 4% of Scotland's sewage discharge points are monitored, compared with 91% in England. First Minister. Our approach to assessing sewage discharges is more effective uh, than that in England. Scottish Water has completed a more extensive environmental study programme to monitor and model the impacts of its facilities on water quality. Uh, data from monitoring is also being used to determine any actions needed to improve Scotland's water environment. And Scottish Water has already invested £686 million since 2010 in improvements and has committed a further uh, half, a million pound, uh, sorry, half a billion pounds during 2021 to 2027. This has contributed to SEPA's most recent classification, showing that 66% of Scotland's water bodies are in good ecological condition. That compares to just 16% in England. Uh, this is in line with aims to achieve 81% by 2027. Alex Cole Hamilton. The problem for the First Minister is that the money he's identified uh, for those extra monitors, 70% um, of all dumping point pipes in Scotland will still go unobserved, whereas in England, every single pipe is due to be monitored by the end of this year. When on earth will we catch up? Look at what we have discovered in the last few weeks. Human waste dumped around Scotland's best-loved beaches, wetlands of international importance and special protection areas from Shetland to the Clyde. And the First Minister should take particular interest in the most used sewage pumping, dumping outlet in Scotland. That recorded 127 releases last year. That's enough to run 100 million baths. And he will know that site well because it is on the bank of the Clyde in his own Glasgow Pollock constituency. Perhaps that's why he moved to Brotty Ferry. So can I ask the First Minister, will he commit today to the introduction of legally binding targets to tackle sewage dumping in Scotland? First Minister. I moved to Brotty Ferry so my stepdaughter could see her father uh, more uh, yeah, recently. Exactly. So. Uh, that is actually the reason uh, why uh, I have moved uh, there, which is not a state secret by any stretch uh, of the imagination. When it comes to the serious issue uh, that Alex Cole Hamilton uh, does raise, uh, we know that uh, combined sewer overflows are a serious issue. He is right, of course, uh, to raise them uh, in his question to me. But they are also integral. They are integral to ensuring uh, that sewers do not, during periods of heavy rainfall, uh, back up and then end up flooding homes, they end up flooding businesses, they end up flooding streets. Uh, right across our country. And our monitoring is uh, more uh, comprehensive, uh, and I'm happy to provide Alasco Hamilton with more detail um, uh, of this. But in terms of the monitoring that was done by Scottish Water, uh, I've got the detail, uh, the detail of it. Uh, I can send to Alasco Hamilton. Uh, it was done over a number of years. And what it does allow us to do uh, is, is comprehensively monitor where these spill overflows are happening. But uh, Scottish Water isn't just uh, sitting on its hands or resting uh, on its laurels. Uh, what it has done has published that improving uh, urban waters route map. That, uh, that outlines how we intend to invest 
uh, in, Scottish water, uh, in the Scottish water uh, environment. So we have a number of projects uh, that are currently underway uh, to, to monitor, but also to make sure that we make improvements to our sewer network. So it is an issue uh, that we take extremely seriously. And I would end just on the point, perhaps, that I started on uh, with Alasco Hamilton's response to his first question, uh, that, that uh, notwithstanding the very serious issues that Alasco Hamilton raises, of course, uh, our water quality in Scotland uh, is uh, very, very good. It shows SIPA's most recent classification showing that 66 per cent of Scotland's water bodies are in good ecological condition compared to 16 per cent in England. And we are aiming to improve that by 81, to 81 per cent uh, by 2027. Mercedes Fialba. Scotland's natural environment is not just the envy of the world, it's also vital to our health. So it's no surprise that reports of more than 14,000 sewage spills have prompted protests across the country, including in Stonehaven in my region this Saturday. Now, in December 2021, Scottish Water vowed to increase storm drain monitors to more than 1,000 by the end of 2024. But according to an FOI response obtained by the I newspaper, as of the 1st of March this year, not a single new device had been installed. So can the First Minister tell us today exactly how many of these 1,000 he expects to see installed by the end of this year? First Minister. Again, it was, it was always the plan, of course, that the installation programme would take place over the course of the summer 2023 and then into 2024. Uh, and so we are still confident, the Scottish Water uh, remains confident, confident that we'll have those 1,000 spill monitors uh, in place by the end of 2024. I'm happy to provide uh, Mercedes uh, Vialba with further detail uh, if she wishes. But I go back to the point uh, that there has been comprehensive uh, monitoring. Uh, the, 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 the studies done by Scottish Water were done between 2015 to 2021. Uh, we have uh, very extensive computer models, for example, that can allow Scottish Water to understand when those combined sewer uh, overflows will spill, uh, under what rainfall conditions, for example, and what impact those spills will then have uh, on the natural environment. So there is a, a whole host of data because of that excellent extensive work that Scottish Water has uh, done. But uh, to answer uh, Ms Vialba's question uh, directly, uh, we are still confident that 1,000 spill monitors uh, will be installed by the end of 2024. Question number four, Co-Cap Stewart. To ask the First Minister whether he will provide an update on the work of the Scottish Government to address potentially dangerous cladding on residential properties. First Minister. Uh, the safety of residents is, of course, an absolute priority for this Government. We're, actively, decisively, we're acting decisively to protect lives through a programme of cladding assessment and remediation. Uh, the current programme includes 105 buildings, which will each go through a comprehensive technical assessment. While we expect that the majority will be safe, if that assessment does identify an immediate fire risk, then we will act without delay, as we have already done. As assessments are completed, we will agree plans and take action to deliver full remediation. And this means uh, I also expect developers to take responsibility to remediate their buildings, so the public purse is not needed to do so. Uh, while I urge them to do so voluntarily, we will use all of the levers at our disposal, uh, including legislation, if necessary, to remediate buildings and to protect residents. Co Cap Stewart. I thank the First Minister for that answer, and he will understand that people's lives have been put on hold, and some of them are at the end of their tether. Local authorities are asking for building warrants for remediation work. Developers are putting safety measures in place that are severely imposing on the lives of people living in these buildings. And yet many residents in my constituents feel that um, a remediation uh, is not moving quickly enough. So, First Minister, my constituents just want their lives back. What further measures can the Scottish Government take to further encourage local authorities and developers to work cooperatively to remove unsafe cladding from these buildings more quickly? First Minister. Well, Co-Cab Stewart is, is right to make a, a couple of uh, key points here. One is that uh, the frustration of her constituents, and I think constituents perhaps in other parts of the country uh, too, that things uh, do not seem to move as quickly on the ground uh, as they would like, and I understand uh, that uh, frustration. Co-Cab Stewart is also right to mention that we are trying to take a collaborative uh, approach with developers, uh, local authorities and others uh, in relation to this particular situation. I can uh, understand uh, how worrying uh, the situation is for those living in buildings uh, with unsafe cladding. That's why we put uh, the safety and well-being of residents very, at the very heart uh, of the cladding remediation uh, programme. Uh, developers uh, must also do the same. They must step up uh, and fix 
uh, their buildings. Our preference has always been that voluntary agreement with uh, developers and getting agreement uh, of uh, the accord. But let me uh, be clear, we are putting the safety of res residents first uh, and foremost, we'll use all the powers we have. And I reiterate uh, what I've already said in response to the first uh, answer to, to COCAB Stewart, that if necessary, we'll use legislation uh, too to ensure that developers do the right thing so we can get on with remediating buildings in line with Scottish building standards. Question number five, Liz Smith. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to a recent poll that found that more than a third of people in Scotland would consider relocating if income taxes were increased further. First Minister. The Scottish Government is proud to have uh, the fairest and most progressive tax system in the UK. Uh, consideration of behavioural changes are, of course, a vital part of our tax policy decisions. Our evaluation of the move to a more progressive tax system in 2018-2019 found no evidence of significant behavioural change, including cross-border migration. Uh, and that should come as no surprise because our social contract with every citizen goes significantly beyond the provisions that are provided in the rest of the UK. It includes free prescriptions, it includes free higher education, supporting more than 400,000 children eligible for, for the Scottish child payment. So we'll continue on that path of progressive taxation. And of course, we'll have robust analysis behind any changes that we make to the tax system. Liz Smith. Uh, thank you. The Scottish Chambers of Commerce, the Federation of Small Business, the Chartered Institute of Taxation, the Institute of Fiscal Studies, Archangel Investment Bank, DJ Alexander Scotland, are just some of those warning of the dangers of widening the tax differential with the rest of the UK. And Sandy Begbie of Scottish Financial Enterprise is warning of the resulting effects on Scottish productivity and economic growth. So can I ask the First Minister, will he give a categorical assurance that he both accepts and understands the widespread and serious concerns amongst the business community and that the future tax policy of Scottish Government should be fully focused on making Scotland the most competitive part of the UK rather than the highest tax part of the UK. First Minister. What was fascinating from that uh, question from Liz Smith is she didn't mention a single anti-poverty campaigner in the list of people that she mentioned. And why does she not? Because, of course, if we want to invest money in tackling poverty, then we have to have the money to be able to do so. And that's why progressive taxation that allows us to, of course, uh, increase revenue to spend on po poverty measures or tackling poverty is so, so crucial. Well, what I would say to Liz Smith, of course we'll listen to those organisations. Many of them I have already met already, uh, and we will continue to listen to them uh, where we possibly can. But we will have robust analysis, robust analysis behind any decision that we make in relation to taxation. I don't and have never seen a conflict uh, in my mind to growing the economy, something that is front and centre as part of the prospectus uh, that, I, uh, that, I, that I published uh, in the first couple of weeks of being First Minister. I see no conflict in growing the economy and also ensuring that you have a progressive tax system so that you can invest, as I say, in anti-poverty measures. So we'll continue to make those uh, very careful, balanced decisions in relation to taxation. We'll make sure we're informed by robust analysis and evidence from many uh, of the, the individuals and organisations that Liz Smith ma mentions, of course, also uh, from the Scottish uh, Fiscal Commission uh, as well. But of course, if we had listened to Liz Smith, if we had listened to the Conservatives, if we had given tax cuts to the wealthiest, then we would have much less money to spend on things like free yeah. prescription charges, on, of course, ensuring that educate, higher education is free, and, of course, that game-changing Scottish child payment proceeding. Ivan McKee. Thank you. Thank you, President Officer. Um, data shows that, uh, regardless of tax rate changes, um, Scotland continues to attract more working-age people from the rest of the UK than move in their own direction, about 20 per cent more on an annual basis, in, uh, in fact. And I know that while the government will do the uh, due diligence and sensitivity analysis for any proposed tax changes, can I, uh, I uh, make the point that a modest increase in inward migration from the rest of the UK to Scotland could significantly increase tax revenues by hundreds of millions of pounds, potentially, to spend on public services in Scotland and support Scottish businesses with skills uh, and uh, attacking their challenges. So can I ask, what is the Scottish Government doing to proactively attract more workers from the rest of the UK to come and live and work in Scotland? First Minister. That's an excellent point uh, made by uh, Ivan McKee. 
uh, and I'm not sure why the Conservatives uh, are laughing from the, the fact, of course... Thank you, members. They, they, they don't like to listen to the facts, and the facts, of course, as Ivan McKee has presented them, are absolutely right. We have seen that modest increase in inward migration from the rest of the UK, and that is an important point. Scotland's record in inward migration from the rest of the UK dispels much of the hysteria from the Conservative Party on the impacts of our tax policy. But it's important to recognise what more we can do, which is why we are committed to establishing a talent attraction programme and migration service for Scotland. That will help uh, us to build upon the success that we've had uh, already in this space. The talent attraction and migration service will improve Scotland's ability to attract and recruit workers from outside Scotland with the skills that our economy needs and supports international workers uh, in that migration and relocation uh, process. What we'll also do is ensure that, of course, where we have the levers uh, over pay, over terms and conditions, that we're embedding fair pay. Uh, we're ensuring that our staff are some of the best paid in the UK. We will do that, for example, and we are doing that in relation uh, to the NHS, where our NHS staff are the best paid anywhere in the UK. So that helps to hopefully attract them up here in Scotland. So we'll put progressive taxation and fair pay uh, at the heart of everything we do in the Scottish Government, a uh, very stark contrast to the approach taken by the Conservatives in England. Question number six, Monica Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I refer to my register of interest as I am a member of the GMB Trade Union. To ask the First Minister whether the Scottish Government will reintroduce the Social Care Staff Support Fund or take other action to improve sick pay provision for social care workers in light of reports of a survey by GMB Scotland stating that 80% of social care workers in the private sector have considered quitting and wider warnings that the care sector is on the brink of collapse. First Minister. Uh, let me recognise that Monica Lennon has often uh, rightly uh, raised these issues around uh, adult social care in particular, uh, and that, uh, of course, uh, the issues she raised are incredibly important. In COVID-19, we all know, uh, it created an enormous challenge for the social care sector in the United uh, Kingdom right throughout uh, the UK, and, of course, including here uh, in Scotland. That is why we introduced the Social Care Support, uh, Staff Support Fund to support the workforce and protect our most vulnerable uh, people. I want to thank social care, uh, the social care workforce for all the vital work that they have done in the course of the height of the pandemic, but also, of course, that they currently uh, do in, in still under extreme uh, pressure and significant challenge. Uh, our fund uh, continued for longer than any other UK nation, but it was always a temporary uh, measure, particularly when self-isolation uh, rules uh, were in place. Uh, fair work is central to improving recruitment, it is central to improving retention uh, and staff well-being in the sector. And so we will continue uh, our work to promote these practices in improving pay and improving conditions and indeed the workers' voice. Uh, to that end, we have guaranteed an additional £100 million to uplift pay to, to £10.90, which took effect uh, from April this year. I have made a commitment to reaching £12 an hour for adult social care workers uh, delivering direct care. Monica Lynn. Carers in the gallery, their colleagues and the people they care for deserve much better than this First Minister. The fund was time limited, but the crisis in social care is getting worse by the day. As highlighted in the Sunday Post, carers are urging the government to reinstate the fund because they cannot afford to get sick. Removing this financial safety net now without an alternative solution will accelerate the collapse of social care and push the NHS further into crisis. To her credit, Jean Freeman listened to the workers, worked with Scottish Labour to introduce the fund in the first place. So, will Hamza Yousaf's government listen, meet with the workers and their unions and do the right thing? First Minister. Of course, uh, we will be happy to meet with trade unions. We do that uh, on a regular occasion. I know the Cabinet Secretary for Health uh, and Social Care uh, will do that. And of course, I am happy to continue my engagement uh, with uh, trade uh, unions. And we are uh, taking action to address uh, pay. That is why we funded uh, a further uh, pay increase to the, to the tune uh, of £100 million this uh, financial year. But it is also why, of course, the work that is being done 
uh, through the National Care Service in order to introduce that legislation, get a National Care Service up and running, to me is so vital because at the heart of the National Care Service are fair work principles, is sectoral bargaining, uh, for example. Now, we're not going to wait for the National Care Service uh, to be uh, in place. There's already work uh, that is going on through uh, the fair work and social care group. They've developed a set of minimum standards for terms and conditions that reflect fair work principles. Uh, these standards do include sick pay, sick pay, they do include maternity and paternity pay to assist with recruitment in the sector. Uh, but that is exactly why we want to make uh, continued progress with the National Care Service, because we do have, uh, because of the landscape of uh, adult social care uh, in the country, with private providers, with uh, in-house local authority providers, with third sector providers, it is fragmented. How much better to have national consistency right across the country, and we can only really do that with a National Care Service. Move to general and constituency supplementaries. I would ask for brief questions and responses, and I call Megan Gallagher. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Scotland's social care watchdog has said children as young as 12 are allowed to consent to puberty blockers. This guidance fails to acknowledge the interim cash review of gender services in England, which identified several failings in the management of the Tavistock Centre and a lack of evidence supporting the use of puberty blockers. More and more brave young people are coming forward to talk openly about detransitioning, their harrowing stories of surgery and the lack of mental and emotional support they received. So can the First Minister clarify if he supports puberty blockers being prescribed to 12-year-olds? First Minister. Well, I, I support these decisions being made by clinicians, being made by those who have clinical knowledge. That is what we should be doing. We should be trusting those with that clinical expertise as opposed to standing up here in the chamber where we don't have those expertise, making judgments about what is best for uh, young people who are in need of gender uh, identity services. In terms of in terms of the cash review, that is an interim uh, report. I think it's well understood that health services in England and Scotland do differ quite significantly. We will, of course, we have, uh, of course, uh, taken account of the interim report. We will look uh, to see the final report uh, once that is ready to. But I go back to my initial point. It's so important, presiding officers, uh, presiding officer, that we trust clinicians, those with the medical expertise and knowledge, uh, on such important decisions. Neil Bibby. Thank you, President Officer. Renfrewshire Council's Education Policy Board meets today to discuss school provision for children in Dargavel following the Council's catastrophic school role miscalculation. The last time I raised this, the expected cost to fix the mess was £20 million. It is now an incredible £75 million. Parents are looking for the Scottish Government to help resolve this situation. Does the First Minister agree that no child in Renfrewshire should have to pay for the Council's incompetence and lose out because of the resulting shortfall in school budgets? And if so, what will the Scottish Government do to ensure there is accountability for this failure and that the appropriate primary and secondary provision is in place as a matter of urgency? First Minister. Well, I will uh, ask the, the current Education Secretary to make sure that uh, we, we will discuss uh, and have those discussions with Renfrewshire uh, where we can. I know the previous Education Secretary was involved uh, in discussions. These are, of course, local authority matters. Now, what Neil Bibby is asking me to do is take money out of the current school building uh, programme uh, and, of course, redistribute that to another uh, project. Now, he would have to say what school we would take that uh, away from because, of course, every single penny is accounted for uh, in terms of the current budget. So, yes, we will continue to have uh, discussions uh, with Renfrewshire Council, as we have done already. But I will ask the Education Secretary uh, to retouch base with Renfrewshire Council because, ultimately, I agree with Neil Bibby's premise uh, that no child uh, should feel that their education or their educational attainment suffers uh, as a result of any decision that is made, be that by national government uh, or, indeed, by local government. Audrey Nicholl. Thank you. The First Minister will be aware that this week marks Mental Health Awareness Week, which has a particular focus this year on anxiety. So, As the cost of living crisis deepens and household bills are soaring, can I ask the First Minister what action his government has taken to mark this important period? First Minister. We know uh, poverty is a key driver of poor mental health. We are prior prioritising work to support those who are the most at risk. As part of Mental Health Awareness Week, the Minister for Social Care, Mental Wellbeing, Sport uh, met with Money Advice and mental health organisations just yesterday uh, to hear firsthand the impact the cost of living crisis is having on mental health in Scotland. We've developed advice for frontline advisors. We've created resources 
for the general population on the Mind to Mind Wellbeing website. And we will continue to work with uh, money uh, and indeed mental health partners to look at what more can be done. We continue to do everything we can to urge the UK government to use all of the powers at its disposal to tackle this cost of living crisis because of the serious impact it's having uh, on uh, mental health of the population. Miles Briggs. Thank you, President Officer. Whistleblowers and campaigners have called on the First Minister to support an independent inquiry into the mishandling of complaints surrounding child protection here in Edinburgh, East Lothian, the Borders and Aberdeenshire. Campaigners believe that a wider independent inquiry is now needed to investigate safeguarding concerns and the way reports from parents, guardians, carers, professionals and the public have been mishandled in, to, in relation to ongoing unresolved child abuse and child protection concerns. The current ongoing Scottish child abuse inquiry remit is narrow and only focuses on historic abuse and specifically to children living in care. So can I ask the First Minister if he'll firstly agree to meet with me personally and campaigners to discuss their concerns and, this, and also whether or not the Scottish Government will take forward an independent inquiry now into these concerns. First Minister. I, I will ensure uh, that the appropriate Minister does meet with Miles Briggs and of course I'm more than happy to, uh, to also uh, consider a request that comes from Miles Briggs uh, representing the families and uh, I should pay credit to Miles Briggs who's raised this issue on a number of occasions uh, in this chamber on behalf of those uh, families that have uh, been affected and this government takes the issues of child protection uh, absolutely seriously, uh, but uh, in reference to the, the, the issues that Miles Briggs uh, has raised, uh, as, as I've said, I'll ensure that the appropriate minister does meet uh, as soon as possible, and I'll also consider an invitation to meet uh, from Miles Briggs and the families involved. And Mark Ruskell. Thank you. In the middle of the cost of living crisis, St Andrews University is increasing rents in their student halls by 8%. Students are at risk of being plunged into poverty as the university lines its own pockets. Does the First Minister agree with me that a rent increase of this scale is completely unacceptable? And will he join me in calling on the university to reverse this decision? First Minister. Well, again, of course, this is a decision for the university uh, to make, but I can completely understand why Mark Ruskell uh, does, of course, raise this important issue. And we have introduced legislation, as Mark Ruskell knows, uh, only too well in relation uh, to ensuring uh, fair uh, rents where appropriate, but there may be uh, areas where uh, we can go uh, further. So we are exploring that uh, quite actively. Uh, what I would say to Mark Ruskell uh, is where I agree with him, that uh, everybody, including, of course, our fantastic uh, higher uh, and indeed further educational institutes, but higher educational institutes in this case, uh, should absolutely be aware of the responsibilities that they have in terms of students uh, who are undoubtedly suffering from a Westminster cost of living crisis, which is impacting everybody, but particularly, of course, impacting uh, on our students. Yeah. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions. The next item of business is a member's business debate in the name of Rona Mackay, and there will be a short suspension before the debate begins.